All right, for our basic course, there are three things you need to learn about interest rates. The first thing is the simplest. It's, it's simply that interest is the price you pay for money. Uh, when you borrow money, you pay a price for that, and that price is interest. It's the price that borrowers pay lenders for transferring purchasing power from the future. I'm going to make money in the future. I can go ahead and, uh, and transfer that money to now, but I've got to pay a price. Price is interest. Interest, which we know now is the price you pay for money, uh, is uh, set uh, by the interaction of buyers and sellers of money, so to speak. Here we have uh, the um, supply of money. It's fixed because the Fed sets it. Here is demand for money, and where quantity supply equals quantity demanded, we get an equilibrium price or equilibrium interest rate. Now, an important point about this, um, uh, if we uh, in increase the supply of money, let's say the Fed moves it over here, look what happens. Our equilibrium interest rate goes down. If the Fed decreases the supply of money, look what happens. Our interest rate goes up. So that's the second thing I want you to learn about interest rates. Uh, interest rates and the money supply have an inverse relationship. When the money supply goes up, interest rates go down, and vice versa. The third and final thing I want you to know about interest rates is that interest rates and bond prices are inversely related, uh, just like interest rates and the money supply. Why is that? Well, let's say uh, you are issued uh, the following bond, uh, this bond right here. Um, it pays, uh, you, or rather, you paid $1,000 for it. All right, let's say it's a 10-year bond, okay? And it pays $50 a year for 10 years, the end of which you'll get your 1,000 back. Well, clearly it's paying 5%. 50 is 5% uh, of $1,000. But let's say before 10 years is up, you need, to, you need the money back quicker because you need to fix your transmission. Uh, and you can sell most bonds in the bond market. It's kind of like the stock market. However, uh, let's suppose the prevailing rate of interest on this type of bond uh, has gone up to 7.5%. Uh, you can't sell the bond for 1000 Why would I pay $1,000 for your bond that pays 5% when I could buy a new bond, similar bond, that would pay 7.5%? However, you can sell your bond at a price that would make the $50 payment uh, equal to 7.5%. Uh, it's simply this. Uh, the, the new price... Let's see if horrible handwriting, I can write this. The new price is going to be the old payment, in this case $50, divided by the new rate. You have to do it as a decimal. And so if we divide $50 by .075, we'll get $667. Uh, and so, so to make the $50 yield equal to 7.5% of the purchase price. In that case, we lost uh, $333. Same scenario. You have a bond, uh, you paid $1,000, it pays $50, that's 5%. You have to sell it early uh, to fix your transmission. Uh, but um, the, um, the, it, the prevailing rate for this kind of bond is now 2.5%. You can actually sell your bond for more. Uh, because uh, you know you, you, you get fifty dollars and uh, somebody would have to pay more uh, to get a fifty dollar payment in this rate environment. So let's apply our formula. We get uh, fifty dollars, and the new rate is uh, 0.25, uh, 0.025 or two point five percent. Well, gosh, fifty divided by that is two thousand dollars. Because the rate fell by half, your bond increased uh, twofold. So who said bond, bonds are, are boring? Uh, you can buy and sell bonds uh, and make a lot of money depending on interest rate movements, although they're very difficult to predict. So uh, interest is the price you pay for bonds. It has an inverse relationship with the money supply. It also has an inverse relationship with bond prices. All right, the Fed's primary purpose is to conduct monetary policy. Me, meaning uh, raising and lowering the level uh, of the money supply. And they have three tools uh, with which to do this. Open market operations, reserve ratio, and the discount rate. Uh, we'll examine each one separately. 
The most important tool really is open market operations, and it consists of buying and selling securities, bonds, um, by the Fed. Uh, the Fed buy, when the Fed buys bonds, it increases the money supply uh, by increasing excess reserves and or checkable deposits, depending on whether they buy from banks or from the public. But the effect is the same. The money supply is increased. Here we see uh, how this works. Um, uh, the Fed expands the money supply by buying bonds because when the Fed buys bonds, either from commercial banks or from individual people, um, the bond flows to the Fed, which of course pays for it, meaning money flows out of the Fed and into, uh, into banks, uh, increasing their excess reserves or, or into uh, the public's checking accounts. Bo both have the effect of increasing the money supply. So buy bonds to expand the money supply. Conversely, when the Fed wants to uh, contract the money supply to suck money out, if perhaps there's too much and inflation is, uh, is uh, on the rise, then it will, uh, it will sell bonds. When it sells bonds uh, to the banks and the public, they have to pay for them, and the Fed has an inflow of money uh, out of the economy. What, what if they don't want to sell bonds? Well, the Fed makes the price attractive, and, and they will sell the bonds and extract the money from the economy. Tool number two, the reserve ratio. Um, you, you know already about the reserve ratio, the, the percentage of, of deposits a bank must keep in reserve. It can't lend out more than that. Uh, and the Fed sets this ratio. Uh, and if it increased, uh, it wanted to increase the money supply, it could lower the ratio. In this example, uh, we have uh, a bank with uh, $800,000 in deposits. Reserve ratio is 25%. That's 200000 That's exactly what they have. They have no excess reserves. They can't make loans. Therefore, they can't create money because when banks make loans, they create money. The Fed lowers the reserve ratio to 10%. That's 80000 Well, now the bank has 120000 excess reserves. They can go out and lend money. That would uh, increase the money supply. Now, conversely, uh, the bank, uh, or the Fed, rather, could, um, could decrease the money supply by raising the reserve ratio. Same scenario, um, and let's say the reserve ratio is 20% of 800,000, that's um, uh, 160. They have 200 in reserves, they have 40 extra, they could go out and lend that. But let's say the, the, uh, the Fed increases the ratio to 25%. Well, that means the amount of reserves they have, 200, is exactly uh, what they need for, uh, for deposits of 800, and they, can, they can't go out and make new loans. The Fed could even uh, increase the ratio to 30 percent, creating a, a $40,000 reserve deficit for this bank. Then they would have to um, contract their deposits, run off depositors some way, or uh, uh, stop making loans and, um, altogether. And that, of course, would have a very contractionary effect on the money supply. The third and final tool is the, the discount rate. Uh, the Fed operates something called the discount window through which it loans money to banks uh, when they have um, unexpected immediate needs for additional funds. It's not literally a window. I don't know why they call it that, but they call it the discount window, and that's where they go to, uh, banks go to borrow money from the Fed. Um, and the rate charged is called the discount rate. Now, the Fed, they could decrease the discount rate, uh, and they would increase the money supply. They would encourage banks to borrow from the discount window. This would increase banks' reserves, excess reserves, and en enhancing their ability uh, to extend credit. This would therefore, of course, when banks make loans, they create money. This would therefore expand the money supply. So you would lower the discount rate to make, to make it more attractive for banks to borrow at the discount window. This makes intuitive sense because I, I stated in another lecture that interest rates, and the discount rate is nothing more than an interest rate, interest rates and the money supply have an inverse relationship, and we see that here. Conversely, uh, if the Fed wanted to um, uh, decrease the money supply, to contract the money supply, it would raise the discount rate, making it more unlikely for banks uh, to borrow at the discount window. Uh, and in fact, ultimately, uh, raising uh, rates in general, which makes money more expensive, uh, and therefore more scarce uh, contracting the money supply.